So very nice to be here for the a last uh, a full Sunday talk at the BSV for a, for a while, probably coming next year. And I'd also like to dedicate the, the talk too to the people who are having birthdays this month, and particularly Savitri, who's here, and that's it. Husband and wife, and they have birthdays within a week of each other. Amazing. So happy birthday and uh, dedicate it to, to you as well. It's very nice to see the support over the years. I mean, the people that keep coming again and again, and for instance, Savitri and Lassit, I don't know how many years we've been offering the breakfast dana on Sunday morning. So it's very inspiring. It's wonderful. So I'll begin with a verse, as I often do. <laughs> and then I have a quiz. Where does the verse come from? <laughs> this, will be, this will be interesting. I think this will fox you. Maybe not. Akoji mang avadhi mang ajini mang ahasi me ye chetang apa upanai hanti verang te sang na samati. So, does that mean, yeah. Anybody recognize the verse? It's terrible pronunciation, but nevertheless. You hear the word verang, so that should give you an idea. Verang means, do people know what that means? Hatred? Hatred. So it's, uh, it's from the Dhammapada. Yeah. Usually when I do these, uh, these verses before, they're always from the Mahamangala Sutta. So people have come to expect, oh, it's the Mahamangala Sutta. <laughs> this time, no. And what does that mean? There's actually three verses, and it's the subject of the talk today, because it's a very important area for all of us, actually. So it's, uh, it's, it's the area that causes the most grief in our lives, all human beings' lives, actually. And who knows, maybe in animals' lives, too. <laughs> So this is what that verse uh, translates it as. He abused me or she abused me. Uh, he or she beat me. He or she defeated me or robbed me. In those who harbour such thoughts, hatred will never cease. And there's a bit more. I didn't do the, <laughs> the rest of them. But, so that's, uh, he, he abused me. He beat me. Defeated me. Robbed me. In those who do not harbour such thoughts, hatred will cease. Hatred never ends through hatred. By non-hate alone does it end. This is an ancient truth. Though There are those who do not realize that one day we all must die, but those who do realize this and settle their quarrels. That's from the Dhammapada. So it's a very, um, the very uh, strong verses, and they remind us that you know, as I say, that negativity doesn't end through negativity. Negativity doesn't end through revenge. So, uh, the, the, what this talk will address, of course, is speech. Look at speech, right speech, what's, what's uh, a useful speech. And also how we let go of resentment is a very important uh, subject. Because I've been speaking to, I've been in contact with a number of people and they've had difficult issues in their life, and how to actually let go of them, because there's usually a lot of anger or resentment connected with them. So this is something that's very useful for all of us. And of course, you know, uh, I think the essence of uh, uh, Dhamma and the essence of life, actually it makes a lot of sense, is, uh, you know, what if, if when we have uh, bushfire management, what's the best bushfire management? Anybody got any ideas? We're coming to the bushfire season here. We probably can't believe it today because it's a very cold day here in Melbourne. <laughs> but uh, it's actually heading towards summer. Prevention, isn't it? Prevention. We have that saying. It's an old saying because it's in the old, old uh, weights and measures. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, they say. That's be a few grams of prevention is better than a kilo of cure. That's better, isn't it? A kilo of cure. Good. Because if we can prevent something from arising, if we can avoid it, then it's much easier. Putting out a small fire is very easy. Putting out a small grievance that we have is much easier than once it is full blown, becomes a full bushfire. And of course, this is the essence of the Buddha's right, uh, right effort, we say, right effort. The first part of right effort is to avoid or prevent uh, negative states of mind from arising. So it's this idea of prevention that is very important. 
and this is one way we can uh, um, look at our practice too, is in terms of preventing some of these things from happening, preventing the bushfires that engulf us and, uh, and uh, putting them out before they become a real problem. And of course, one of the biggest ways of doing that, uh, this is leading up to right speech, is using our wisdom too. And because I know my, for myself and for many people, uh, and Iakima used to call this the blaming game. We blame others. And this is a very strong tendency. When we blame others, we feel completely justified in our view that they're in the wrong. We're convinced of it. And then we can blame them or the situation for the suffering it's causing us. But of course, I think all of us realise, I'll ask you, where is the suffering when we're angry, when we're, up, good morning, when we're angry and we're upset? Where is the suffering? It's inside us. <laughs> the other person, quite interestingly, they may not be suffering at all, they may not be upset at all. Because sometimes, of course, it's, it's, it can be the case, they're not aware, they didn't deliberately do it, um, and they may have done it unintentionally. And also, it can often, often cases, it can be a misunderstanding. I've seen that in my situations, particularly living in Sri Lanka, where I speak the language somewhat, but there's a lot of room for misunderstanding, not understanding what I've been told. So, so this is a very important, uh, important point that we often forget when we're angry and upset, that it's in us. And Ayakema would say, these, she was uh, one of my teachers, she was a uh, German nun who lived in Australia, lived in Sri Lanka and then in Germany as well, and quite a famous teacher, and came here to the BSV. She's not in the pictures, because <laughs> she passed away in 1997. She would say, when somebody upsets us, when somebody says or does something that we cannot, that really gets us going, she said, aha, uh -huh, the only the trigger. <laughs> It's very easy to say that, isn't it? When, when, we, when we, can, we can understand that for sure. But uh, this is really the case. And she used to say, you know, that our job is to recognise that fact, recognise what's going on, that this person has triggered our anger, we're upset, or whatever it is they've triggered in us. And not to blame them, not to blame ourselves either. Sometimes as Buddhists we can blame ourselves, oh, I shouldn't get angry, <laughs> I should be, you know, equanimous, I should have a lot of uh, metta or mindfree for all people. And of course that's good, that's the best prevention actually. But we don't blame ourselves. And then she would say, change. So then this is a very a positive way of looking at you know, situations that are difficult for us. And we'll all encounter difficult situations. And one of the important things that uh, I think it's good to emphasize, the, th the problems that we come up against in life, you know, whether it be, you know, we, t we talk of it in Buddhist terms, it's due to greed or wanting, desire, whether it be due to anger, ill will, all these sorts of things. These are defilements in our minds. And this is where we need to work. This is the place that we work. I sometimes hear Buddhists say, you know, if I can get this anger out of the way, then I can really meditate. <laughs> of course, that's true. But that means they have to deal with the anger first. And that is actually part of our, um, our practice, very important part of the practice, not to, not to diminish that. It is, yes, it is an obstacle. It's making our life difficult. But it's something we need to understand, something we need to address. And once we've done that, the meditation very easy and the wisdom will come too. Because these uh, defilements, these are the obstacles that block the meditation and they block wisdom as well. So it's very, these are, these are our, uh, I sometimes say they're our kamatana. This is a Pali word for the, uh, it really translates as workplace. <laughs> it's our workplace, spiritual workplace, kamatana because this is what we need to address and not to, to think that that's a, a side issue. That is the main issue, really. And when we, oftentimes when we blame others, it really is, and I came, I used to, uh, came I used to mention this, it's just trying to escape from our own inner uh, uh, um, unease, unhappiness, anger, whatever it is, that defilement, is trying to escape from it, not owning, not re being responsible, uh, realising who's responsible for the anger. 
you know, in terms of our experience. Of course, it's us, there's trigger. And as I say to people, some of the triggers can be pretty, <laughs> pretty good. So it's good to keep that in mind, you know, that uh, it's, uh, it can be uh, difficult situations where things will trigger these responses. But I always say to people, you know, if we think, if we reflect in uh, Buddhist terms, that someone who's fully enlightened, will they get angry if somebody hits them, if someone uh, uh, stabs them or shoots them? There's no anger there to get angry. And I came, she used to have the lovely simile for this. She called it the jack-in-the-box. It's really old-fashioned now. <laughs> I think some people might remember what a jack-in-the-box is. This little doll, it's on a spring in a box. And the box is usually beautifully you know, painted or, or coloured. And uh, the idea is, it's usually used for children, actually. You touch the lid and it goes, and the doll jumps out, and the child goes, oh, <laughs> all very happy, and so on. But she said, when somebody's developed their practice, when they've really uh, dealt with all the negativity in their life, when they've taken greed, hatred, and delusion out of their minds, then it's like this box. And anybody you can hit it with a hammer and nothing will j jump out. It's like the doll has been taken out, the spring has been taken out. And this is wonderful, you know. In other words, no one can press your buttons. <laughs> so if you're looking for, for that experience, become enlightened. You can remove those uh, qualities from our, um, our minds. And of course, the other thing that she emphasised, and this is very important for us too, to bear this in mind, is that these difficulties, these sufferings, she used to say, Dukkha is our best teacher. Dukkha is our best teacher. Dukkha in Buddhism is unhappiness. We usually say suffering. It's all those negative experiences that we have. And why is that our best teacher? Because she, she would say, you know, if you go to a meditation retreat, she'd say, and uh, you say to the teacher, oh, my back's killing me. That's right, the back is killing, my knees are killing me, you know, oh, I can't meditate. The teacher will probably say to you, or may say to you, go home, you know, you're welcome to go home. And she said, ah, but Dukkha's not like that. You say your back's hurting, your knees are hurting. No way, Dukkha's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> It'll be with you. So when we have dukkha in our life, it's actually a great motivator. Sometimes people think Buddhism is so negative, you know, we talk about dukkha, about suffering, about unhappiness. But if you look at your life, if you look at my, I look at my life, I see what a motivator it is. You know, I'll really do something if I've got dukkha. We have to. So where, where the spiritual practice is, of course, it's not looking out there, it's looking in here. The world will be as the world always has been. You know, it will be difficulties, there will be problems, there will be issues out there. What we have to do, where it becomes a spiritual practice, is when we look within, look at our reaction, instead of, you know, blaming others, instead of reacting and take, wanting to take revenge out there in the world. And this is uh, uh, another teacher, one of my favourite teachers, uh, Sayadu Utejaniya, has uh, got a lovely book. And it's called, Don't Look Down on the Defilements, They Will Laugh at You. <laughs> and that's very true. That's when we look inside, we can become quite humble, actually, because we realise, you know, our own defilements. And then we, we don't tend to look so much at other people and think negatively about them. And it's always very good, you know, um, when we're angry or upset. This is one of Ajahn Brahm's... Uh, are very useful methods and also his predecessor Ajahn Jagri used to teach this too and he called it the uh, defence lawyer. He said when we're, up, uh, when we're upset, when we're angry, we've really got an issue going, it's like a court he says, you know, and we, we're, the, we're the, uh, the prosecuting lawyer and we're giving all the, and we're also the judge actually, <laughs> both of them, we're giving all the evidence, you know, what criminal actions this person's done, you know, against me and, 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 and remembering, bringing up all the, the times that this has occurred and, and going into it in great detail. And actually in the process, you see, when we're like that, we get angrier and angrier because we feel, oh yeah, because... Anger really needs justification to uh, support it. It really gives it a lot of power if we feel that we're justified. And Ajahn Brahm said he realised that this was how you know he was dealing with anger in his life. I don't know about you, but I find that must have been a long time ago. 
I, I, I don't think I've seen Ajahn Ram angry with anybody. So uh, it must have been a long time ago. And then he, he thought of an idea. He thought, well, why don't I introduce the defence lawyer? We only hear the prosecuting lawyer. When we're angry, upset with somebody, we only hear that the negative stuff. You know, she did that, he did that. And when they said this, <laughs> and so on. And then he says, and I'll read this. This is from Opening the Door of Your Heart, actually. And I love it. I think it's really good. He said, many years ago, so it was a while ago, this is the process I saw hap happen in my own mind whenever I got angry. I, it's, I seemed so unfair. So the next time I wanted to get angry with someone, I paused to let the defence lawyer have their say. I thought up plausible excuses, excuses and probable explanations for their behaviour. I gave importance to the beauty of forgiveness. I found that conscience would not allow a verdict of guilty anymore. It became impossible to judge the behaviour of another. Anger, not being justified, was starved of its food and died. So that's very nice. That's a nice idea, isn't it, to, to use the defence lawyer. I do that sometimes, you know, when, when uh, you know, I encounter people and I think, well, gee, they're very grumpy or whatever. And I think, oh, maybe they're tired or, you know, had a bad day. One thing I can usually be sure of, and I think most of you may have experienced this if, you've, if you're older, is in the end you often find it has nothing to do with you, <laughs> somebody else or some other experience that's causing the person to behave that way. And I think it's very good to realise that too, that so often uh, the, uh, the uh, issues that we have, the anger that arises and so on, comes from misunderstandings because we, we tend, when a, when a person, for instance, is unfriendly or grumpy or whatever, we tend to take it personally and we make up stories where we assume that they must be angry with us, that it must be us that's caused them this grief, rather than thinking, well, maybe it's, who knows, the defence lawyer can come in and say maybe they've just not slept well the night before or whatever it is. But usually we jump to conclusions. And for me, the classic illustration of this is the unanswered email. If you, you had this, I think everybody can relate to this. You know, I've, I had it just recently, you know, I hadn't answered an email from a, a monk friend of mine for a long time. It wasn't very pressing, I thought, the email. And then, then I get this email saying, uh, are you upset with me? You know, is it, is it what I said in that email when I said this, that and the other? And there's a whole paragraph going, going on about this. And it's those stories that we tell, you know, the, the conclusions that we jump to, the assumptions we make. And so this highlights, of course, you know, the, um, the essence of, the, uh, of anger, um, greed, all these things is pivots on, doesn't it? This sense of self that we have, this ego that we have. That makes all these things possible, actually. <laughs> and especially when we feel justified. So, as I mentioned, the point of the, uh, the talk will be the prevention, and you know, an ounce of prevention or a few grams of prevention is better than a kilo of cure, is, is of course, you know, through our sila, our, our actions of body and speech. And we've taken the precepts, and these are a great way to avoid issues to begin with, to, to uh, as it were, prevent them from arising. Because if we're not killing living beings, we're not stealing, we're not breaking up people's relations, sexual relationships, we're not lying, and we're not taking alcohol and drugs. The basis for uh, problems arising is greatly reduced, greatly reduced. Of course, there can still be uh, problems, but we know one of the great things with uh, taking ethical behaviour is we can feel confident from our side. I've done my best, I'm doing my best. However others take that, that's there, they're up to them, not, not to me. So, and now I'd like to, this one I was actually going to start with, but this is a fantastic saying from the Buddha, and I think it's so strong, you know, so, um, as I say, some of the images that the Buddha had are unforgettable. I always challenge people to try and forget some of them because they just stick. I think, how could you dislodge them? And he says, this is in the Sutta Nipata, every person is born, no, every person who is born is born with an axe in their mouth. An axe in their mouth. <laughs> 
A fool who abuses or uses harsh language cuts themselves and others with that axe. And that, that's a really good way of looking at speech, you know, it's like an axe. But I always say, I encourage people, it's an axe we can use or we don't have to use it. And that's up to us. And if we have, you know, enough mindfulness, we have a choice. If we don't have mindfulness, of course, we just react habitually. And before we know it, the axe is out. Maybe we could update this uh, image. I'm sure Ajahn Brahm has done it already, perhaps. We could change it to a chainsaw in the mouth. <laughs> Every, every person who is born is born with a chainsaw in their mouth. <laughs> a fool who uses abusive speech, language cuts themselves and others with that chainsaw. So very important the right speech. So I thought I'd just talk about that. It can, you, we can never talk enough about it, but the important thing actually is to do it, isn't it? To actually take it on board. And I'll give some criteria for right speech that is very useful. And also to use mindfulness is, is particularly important. It's only with mindfulness, the sense of being present, being aware of what's happening, that we have a choice actually. Otherwise we're running on the programs that, uh, and all the conditioning that we have, ha we have. So right speech of course is the third element of the Noble Eightfold Path, the third spoke of the no Noble Eightfold Path. And it covers of course um, the precept is only for lying, against lying. I undertake the training rule to refrain from lying. But of course, right speech is fourfold, it's another three. And it covers, because uh, right speech is not only um, the things we say, it's how we say it too, isn't it? Because sometimes, you know, if you, if you write down what somebody says, it doesn't sound so bad. But if you're there and you hear how they say it, you think, wow. <laughs> The tone can be so fierce, it makes a big difference. So the four types of wrong speech are lying, which we've, you know, as I mentioned, is in the fourth precept. And divisive speech, this is actually, I prefer to use now, uh, not telling tales, but talking behind people's backs. This is really uh, destructive, really destructive. And that, these days, of course, that's taken on new dimensions because we have the internet and you know you have Twitter and all these things and you can go around the world and you're talking behind people's back but they'll find out about it and you have it with young young people don't you some of you have children that you know uh, have got Facebook or whatever and we have you know where people commit suicide because of what's been put on Facebook and so on that's incredible isn't it that's the power of speech this is written actually but it's still speech and the third type of speech the, uh, the Buddha uh, was re uh, referring to that we should refrain from is abusive speech, harsh or abusive speech. And this is very obvious too. And I'll go into those a little bit in a minute. And the last is gossip or idle chatter. And uh, again, the internet is a, <laughs> is a venue par excellence for gossip to go around the world. Some of it may be true, some of it may be not true. But, uh, and people always interested. <laughs> and it can have a very destructive effect, can't it? The gossip, it can be very, very destructive. You see it, I mentioned that too, that in the village context, you know, I live in Sri Lanka in a village, gossip is something that is a, is a real bugbear, it's a real, the negative side of village life. The positive side is people are always together, you know, have a sense of connection and uh, a place in the, in the village and everybody knows everybody, but everybody knows everybody's business too. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, that sense of gossip is, uh, is, is a very important thing to avoid getting into. It's always, yes. And there's two levels of practicing right speech. And one level is the level of restraining from these things. And that is good enough. That's good enough. If we can not lie, if we uh, don't use, don't talk behind people's backs, if we don't use abusive speech and we don't gossip, fantastic. That's good enough. But the Buddha said we can go further than that and we can do the, develop the positive aspects of speech which are the opposite. So instead of telling lies, what's the opposite? Truth, yeah. Instead of uh, talking behind people's backs, dividing them from uh, other people, uh, the opposite is to use harmonious speech, try to bring people together rather than divide them. There's enough division in our world <laughs> as it is. And uh, abusive speech, what would be the opposite of abusive speech? Kind, kind yeah, kind speech and gentle speech. 
and this is this can be so uh, so healing and helpful for people actually just this sort of kind gentle speech and the opposite of gossip <laughs> Nobody can think of that. <laughs> it's a hard one. Meaningful, meaningful speech. Meaningful speech. Things that talk about facts, that uh, talk about things that have some <laughs> some purpose to them, you know. So, uh, and um, and I thought I'd give an example of uh, uh, of of speech and uh, how it can be used as a weapon, actually. And this is from Nasrudin. I think some of you know you've heard this story, so please forgive me. Fortunately, I don't tell, I don't speak as often as Ajahn Brahm, so I don't repeat myself as, <laughs> as often. <laughs> so this is Nasrudin, who was a Sufi holy man, or so they say was holy, he was certainly quite a teacher. And uh, one day he had made an appointment to meet with a philosopher, and they were going to have some sort of discussion or probably debate, and uh, uh, Nasrudin and he were going to meet at his house. And so the philosopher came to his house, to Nasrudin's house, but Nasrudin had forgotten. And so what happened? The philosopher was so angry, so, you know, how rude of him to forget that we had this important conversation. Who does he think? And so he wrote on the door, and what did he write on the door? Stupid oaf, stupid oaf. And then he, he went off in a huff, as they say, back to his home. And when Nasrudin returned, not much later, he saw this uh, writing on, the, on the, the door, stupid oaf, and he immediately remembered the philosopher and he had that appointment so he rushed to the philosopher's house and he said to the and the philosopher opened the door and he said i'm so sorry i forgot the appointment but i saw you left your name on my door <laughs> <laughs> typical nazareth this is we say scoring points i don't know what sort of debate they had after that <laughs> I mean, probably out with a boxing glove, I suspect. <laughs> but it's quite interesting that often what we say, and this is always a good reflection to what often what we say is what people uh, respond with. So if we are angry, often people just come back at us in a very in a similar way. Or if we accuse them or we blame them, people don't like blaming at all. It's one of the uh, worldly conditions the Buddha said people. Uh, criticism, blame, that we don't like at all. We try to avoid at all costs. And it brings up this sense of self in a 3D. <laughs> 3D. So it can do enormous harm or good uh, words. So I just mentioned the, the different types of speech just briefly because we the time is going. So we refrain from false speech and we develop truthful speech. is very important. Um, and, and we have to ask ourselves, does lying cause us a problem? One of the interesting things for me is I realise in myself and I realise in our society, there's a lot of lying that goes on that we just take for normal, take for normal. And a good example to me, it was given to me, I hear it was from Irish, Venerable Irish Buddha Rakata, is when parents say to their children, if anybody calls, tell them I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is that? <laughs> We wouldn't think twice about that, do we? We don't think, well, yeah, that's what you say. <laughs> but actually, it's a lie. You know, the, the wise child might, might say to the person when they ring, oh, my parents have told me I should tell anybody that rings that they're out now. <laughs> <laughs> then it wouldn't be a lie, it would be reported speech. And children are actually very good at that, aren't they? But they really say things that really catch their parents out, actually. And oftentimes people feel that it's okay to lie as long as you don't get caught. <laughs> So this is, this is another thing we should look at. And of course, there are many types of lying that we have. You know, we have, uh, and, we, and they're at different levels and they're worth, worth uh, reflecting on. You know, when people ask us how we are, and we say, and we're feeling terrible, we say, oh, fine, fine. <laughs> you know, these sorts of things. Is that a lie? Or, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's interesting to think, <coughs> think about that, whether we're putting, kicking up appearances and putting on a happy face. Is that a lie? I don't know. And of course, more, more importantly, lying to ourselves is, is, is uh, very damaging. If we, we can't see our own, our own faults, can't see our own negative uh, qualities, if we can't be honest about ourselves, it's very difficult to develop truth. And this is why the Buddha emphasised right speech so much, because 
you know, he, he said, you know, that anybody who can tell a deliberate lie, and that's what a lie is, something very deliberate, is capable of doing anything else, any of the other things. And he said this to his son, Rahula, when he was only seven years old, and he gave him a really strong teaching about that, you know, about not lying. And not to even lie for a joke, the Buddha said. So one day, when the, the Buddha came to the monastery where his son was, his son had been telling a lie. Evidently, he used, this is what they say, they, he's told people that when the Buddha wasn't at the monastery, yes, the Buddha's here. And when the Buddha uh, was there, he'd tell them, no, no, he's not here. <laughs> this is the sort of thing kids do. <laughs> but the Buddha came and uh, Rahula, his son, Venerable Rahula, had some water. This is very traditional, they put a seat out and they have some water for washing the feet because they're barefoot, no, no thongs <laughs> for the Buddha. And he was washing his feet and he left a little bit of water in the, in the container. And he said to Rahula, anybody that can tell a, spirit, uh, tell a lie is like this little bit of water left in this container. That, ha that is how much of the spiritual life they have in them. Then he'd throw it away and then he said, and anybody that can tell a, a deliberate lie, they've thrown away the spiritual life. And then he turned, and then it was empty, and he said, anybody that can tell a deliberate lie is empty of the qualities of the spiritual life. And then he turned it upside down, and he said, anybody that is, can tell a deliberate lie is like this. They cannot, um, it cannot receive anything. They've turned upside down the spiritual life. That's it. Turned upside down. Heavy, isn't it? But he was making a point, really. It's very graphic because with children too, of course, you have to have something that's a, a, like a, a living example. And he really, he really made it very, very strong point to him. And his his teaching then was to be aware. And he asked him. Then he asked him, "What's a mirror for, Rahula? What's a mirror for?" And his son said, "For reflection, for seeing yourself." And he said, "Yes." And he said, "Before you do something, before you say something, or even think something." Think of, is this going to harm myself? Is this going to harm others? Is this going to bring benefit to myself? Is it going to bring benefit to others? Is this a, a good thing or not a good thing? Before you do it, while you're doing it, and, while, and afterwards to reflect on what you're uh, doing, what you're saying, and even what you're thinking. So this was the teaching he gave uh, his own son as a way to, you know, to bring mindfulness to, to the act of speech, uh, speaking so that we're aware before we speak, if we can, <laughs> of where we're coming from. Then when we speak, we can see where we're coming from. And if it's, if it's, it's getting pretty rough, then maybe we can stop, if possible, and then afterwards to reflect what were the consequences of that. Was it good? Was it a, a pleasant result or an unpleasant result? So this teaching that he gave to his son, to me, is one of, the, one of my most favourite teachings. A very simple teaching, but a very strong teaching, you know, that uh, really makes life, makes the issues of ethics what we do, what we say, very, very clear, you know. And as I say, if we have mindfulness, we can choose. So that's, uh, and of course, truthful speech. If we want to discover the truth, we have to speak truthfully too. It's very important. And these days, you know, in days of uh, advertising and all these sorts of things, there are so many half-truths and things and lots and lots of asterisks. <laughs> conditions apply and they're in the conditions are so small they, they you, can, you can hardly read them and this is this is I say this is actually a very good very good uh, description of samsara this is the the uh, being born and being uh, reborn again and again conditions apply <laughs> but we get into it and we only realize once we're into it so so it's very important the second type of speech as I mentioned is uh, um, talking behind people's backs. And it's very important to mention that this can actually even be true. Sometimes it's true, but it's e even more uh, reprehensible <laughs> if it's not true. But it's not good even if it's true, actually. And the intention is to hurt and harm, isn't it? And this is one of, the, one of the very, very important points with the, the uh, ethical conduct is that we're aiming, what are we aiming to be? Harmless, harmless. We're aiming to purify our body and uh, our our conduct of body and speech, but also, but harmless. So, 
this intention to harm or hurt another, this is often, this is the axe, isn't it? <laughs> Getting the axe out of the mouth. Or, and uh, so this is something that we can remember, that, uh, that uh, the essence of not wishing to harm others, not wishing to harm ourselves. And then, and good to remember too, as I mentioned before, that this can occur in, on the internet par excellence. People can really gossip behind other people's backs with the full knowledge that others will probably find out, actually. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a, like a, a, a terrible way to make a lot of bad karma, actually. And then, as I mentioned, this is uh, the abusive speech is is very important one too, because this is really uh, causes a lot of damage. When people swear at people here in Australia, people swear without being aware of it. Actually, <laughs> I've, if you pointed out to some people they were swearing every second word, they'd say, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> they wouldn't know because the mindfulness is not there. But sarcasm is included in this, isn't it? abusive speech, because we can be very, we can say something sarcastic and really cut to the bone, and we can be over blunt, or we can use belittling criticism. So, and it's always motivated by anger or ill will. You know, it's coming from a negative side. And I often remember one of my friends, uh, he used to say when he was a child, his mother was, very good at verbal abuse, you know, it was a psychological abuse and um, emotional abuse. And he used to say to me, I wish she'd hit me instead of saying those things. It would have been easier than the verbal abuse, you know, being abused verbally. So it's good to remember that the speech is, is very important. And just to lighten up from there, there's a lovely story, I, I love this story actually, it's about a Greek um, teacher, he was a philosopher again, I don't know if he was angry, <laughs> and he, he was teaching one of his disciples and he said, this will be your practice for, for a length of time, for three years actually it turned out. Whenever anyone insults you, you must pay them something, give them money when they insult you. Wow, isn't that an incredible spiritual practice? <laughs> Somebody says, you know, you're an idiot and you pay them a dollar or five dollars or whatever it is. <laughs> Amazing idea. So he did this for three years. And then the teacher said to him, the philosopher said to him, uh, now you don't have to do that. He said, now you're ready to go to Athens and learn wisdom. Interesting, isn't it? Three years of insult and then he's ready to learn wisdom. I can ask you why that would be the case in a minute. And so when he went to Athens, because Athens was, as I call it in Australia, we call it the, the big smoke. It was the, you know, the capital city and the area, actually, the whole of that area probably. Um, probably like London or New York of their day. And when he went to the gates, coming through the gates of the city, there was a, a so-called wise person there. And what was he doing? He was insulting everyone that came in the gate. So what did he do when he saw this uh, student of this uh, philosopher? He insulted him. And what did the student do? No, he didn't pay him. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have to anymore. He laughed. He laughed. And the wise, so-called wise man said, why are you laughing? Ah, he said, I used to have to pay for this. Now I'm getting it free. <laughs> And he said to him, ah, enter the city, You're, it is yours, <laughs> it's all yours. You're ready to develop wisdom. So very interesting, it's a lovely story, isn't it? I love that story. It comes from the Desert Fathers, so it's in the Christian tradition, actually. It's in the Christian tradition. And, but what the point of it to me is, a big part of our anger, our hurt, our issues, is ego, isn't it? And if you spend three years paying for insults, after a while, you, what do you hear? Words? They're just words. <laughs> you know, it's the, as, uh, as we were saying the other day, as we were saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I think it was Winnie the Pooh you were talking about, Tower, mm -hmm. Tower of Pooh, yeah. And that's very true. And if you pay for it for three years, that would be very much the experience you'd have. So what? <laughs> so what? And you develop that wisdom. And once we have that wisdom that these are only words, we don't have to react, react to them. We have a choice. And, we, and it focuses you on the in, inner life to the what's going on inside. Then when we have that uh, ability, when we have that wisdom, then we can really learn 
Because the obstacle to learning is often ourselves, our ego, a sense of who I am and all this and a sense of pride can come with it. So the, uh, the next type of speech, of course, is the, uh, the last one is the fourth one, refraining from gossip. And this is a very important one. Most people, if you, I think yourself, uh, probably myself, and, and you probably think too, what's the harm in gossip? But I think if we look at it, you know, and look at it in, uh, in a very rational way, you can see that it can do a lot of harm. It's not all just light-hearted and just a bit of entertainment. It may be our entertainment, but it can hurt people in a very, very serious way. So it's, and as I say, the mass media is very, uh, very uh, well uh, used a lot for this purpose, gossip, and. We're all fascinated. We, want, we all want to know what Megan Markle's wearing and all these sorts of... Who, who needs to know these things? I don't know. But it leads, to, it leads to quarrels for sure and problems. It really leads to misunderstanding. Wastes our time and, of course, in the Buddhist terms, confuses our minds. You know, it just makes our minds busy with stuff that we don't need. There's enough, there's enough important things going on. So. But most, most importantly, I'd like to get to this and uh, then talk about mindfulness a little bit, is the principles for developing right speech. Because this is more important. You know, if we take on board some of these ideas, if you can remember them. And I like Bhante uh, uh, Gunaratana. He did his own list, which is a bit of a compilation of the Buddhas. And, uh, um, also um, other sources, his own thinking, I think, too. First of all, is it true? So this is, you know, not lying. For, is it true what I'm going to say? Is what I'm going to say kind? And the Buddha would say, is it coming from loving kindness, from metta or maitri? Is it beneficial? You know, is, there any, is it useful for myself or for the other person? And does it harm myself or the other person? That's, so this is, again, the Buddha's advice to Rahula, isn't it, to his son. And is this the right time to say something? And uh, uh, the other day when I was at Newbury, I also saw Ajahn Brahm added another one to it that's very good. I don't think the Buddha used it, actually. I don't think, is this the right place? That's very important, actually. Sometimes it's not the right place. You'd, you'd, if you tell someone off in a public con a context, to the other people around, wow, will that feel like dynamite? That will really get that other person. Could upset them very much, you know. So important to remember that. And of course, I mentioned the the criteria that the Buddha gave to his son Rahula. Does it harm oneself or others? Is it coming from a negative? Uh, motivation or a positive motivation and what are the consequences are they pleasant or unpleasant and to reflect before we do before we say before we think during it and then afterwards and uh, this was the Buddha's actual list that you can compare it with Bhante Gunaratna's list uh, for uh, um, when we need to tell somebody something they don't want to hear. <laughs> so this is good for bosses, for, for anybody actually, in any situation. Uh, for monks, we, you know, before we actually speak to another monk uh, uh, to bring up an issue, we have to ask their permission first. We should actually ask them, if, can I speak to you about a matter? You don't have to say what it is, but you actually have to ask that first. It's, it's not good form just to launch straight into it. That may happen out of anger. So the Buddha said, if we're going to, uh, this is in the, in the uh, English words we use, admonish somebody or tell someone off or tell them something they don't want to hear, is this, you have to be, he suggested, reflect, is it at the right time? Is this the right time? Are we using facts? Are we using facts or just, you know, uh, you know just coming from anger or um, saying things that are not only hearsay, for instance? Is it beneficial? And are we speaking gently and softly? That's very important. Because if you, even if we raise our voices, sometimes people think, you're angry with me. And I know that's not always the case, you know. I heard in Malaysia, people like to, sp in Chinese Malaysian, people like to speak quite loudly, and that can be misinterpreted too. And am I coming from loving kindness? So that's the Buddha's criteria. And one thing uh, that I really like that uh, um, Bhante Gunaratna said, and this is in his Eight Steps 
uh, eight, eight mindful steps to happiness. And he, he, this is a lovely saying, simply refuse to let your anger tell you what to say. Simply refuse to let your anger tell you what to say. Easy to say that, but just to remember that, you know, that I want to have choice about what I say. That can deter us. And he, he recommends concentrating on the breath, coming back to the breath. And uh, he says for two minutes, but I can't imagine anybody could, if you're that angry, two minutes is a long time actually to focus on the breath. One of the things one can always do, you know, with speech too, this is a hard, very hard one. The Buddha did it a lot. If somebody asked him something uh, that he felt he couldn't reply to in a beneficial way, he'd be silent. It's really difficult to, if somebody's saying something to you and not react, if you don't react to it, if you're silent, see how it goes. Sometimes it can be a useful thing. Sometimes it'll just make them more angry, actually, if one doesn't. It's also very hard to do. So to bring speech into the area of mindfulness is very important. See it as our part of our practice. It's a very difficult part of our practice because our tongue is... <laughs> connected to our uh, conditioning uh, very much and it's auto almost automatic. But I know when I was uh, with Saido Utejaniya in uh, Myanmar, that was part of the emphasis was mindful speaking. So he, he did not have uh, the idea of noble silence. You know, in most meditation centers you have the idea of noble silence, no, no speaking, you know. But he wanted people to actually speak to each other and be mindful of what they were doing, where they're coming from, while they were speaking. What defilements were coming up, you know? Because then it makes it part, it makes it part of our spiritual practice, and that's what we should see it as part of our spiritual practice. Is it is it a gift we're giving to other people or a real, uh, you know, a real uh, hazard? So, so we can, as I say, this is where mindfulness can give us choice if we check up before we speak while we're speaking and afterwards. And we can learn from, uh, of course, what we learn from our speech is we can learn to refrain or restrain ourselves. That's not easy, actually. Sometimes people think, you know, that's an easy matter, but it isn't, especially when there's a lot of conditioning, there's a lot of automatic response. To actually stop ourselves from saying or doing something is not easy. And it's a very, very good spiritual practice because the, if we build up that quality, that ability to refrain or restrain from doing things, it will lead to our happiness and well-being. The Buddha emphasized this. This is the muscle of restraint and it's a very, very useful thing that we have to be able to just say no to something and know that this, this is something that uh, is useful, lead to our happiness and well-being. And this is an internal restraint, an internal refraining. It's not the Buddha saying, don't do this, don't do that. It's not a commandment. So it's, uh, and also, very importantly, with a speech, you know, in terms of being mindful of speech, if we look at what happens afterwards, see the results of what, what we've said and done, you know, sometimes very nice, very positive, sometimes the results are incredible. People don't speak to each other for years, they have grudges and carry on and uh, they, you know, want revenge and there may be even actions, you know, then bodily actions can start up, you know, start punching and, and all these sorts of things. So it's good to just reflect mindfully on the results of it. Be honest about it too. And of course, you know, we, very important with speech is to make a resolution to have a determination to speak um, without an intention to hurt others or ourselves, to, to speak softly. You know, just have it in mind when I speak, I want, I'd like to speak in this way, whatever that way is. Um, as they say, the Buddha was talking about not intentionally hurting through our speech, um, using soft or gentle words, well-chosen words as one, and bringing harmony to uh, the situation, whatever that situation is. And this is very useful because this is called, called Ajahn Brahm calls it programming the mind. So this is something that's very useful because once we, we can reprogram our minds, we've got plenty of programming in there actually. <laughs> it's really a matter of rewriting the program that we're, we're about. 
So we can reprogram. And if we're aware of the things that are, you know, uh, are, are difficult for us that will often um, press our buttons, then we can just be aware. No, when, when, if anybody says this, I won't immediately give them as good as they gave me. I will refrain from that. So when we are mindful, we have a choice. When we are not mindful, we have no choice. We're running on the program. So there's a very so it's an encouragement to actually to be mindful uh, and to have a choice. So I'd like just to finish with uh, Bhanteji's test of skillful speech. Is it true what I'm going to say? Uh, is it kind what I'm going to say? Is it beneficial or useful what I'm going to say? Does it hurt me or anyone else? And is this the right time to say it? And the last one, Ajahn Brahms, is this the right place? <laughs> so I'd like to finish with that, um, uh, those reflections on right speech. And hopefully you can take something away that's useful, you know, because this is the main thing. You know, it's very nice to have talks, but if they're not practical and you can't take something away and use it in your daily life, then, you know, it's, what's the point? <laughs> And, and it, one of the things I really like about the Buddha's teaching is very practical, very practical. It can be used, in a, you can look at it in a very philosophical way, a very, th very theoretical way, but it's intended for use, for practice. So this is, this is the point of it. So if there are any questions, please, uh, uh, you're welcome to ask them now. Yes. Fine. I hope your speech is going to be extraordinary. Actually, people when they're at the Buddha Center, they're very well spoken. <laughs> you hardly ever hear, you know, uh, angry arguments, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, we've got two from online, but is there any from the floor? Any, any from the floor? Here we are. Yes. What would you like to ask? Um, just more of a reflection. Um, so. Comments. Yes, well, it's kind of, it is a question. So you talked a lot about refraining. Yeah. If there's, some, say, some harm being done, some speech yes. toward you or someone else that yeah. is perhaps yes. seen as harmful or felt as harmful. Mm. And the habit for some of us could be that we do tend to refrain a lot. Oh, I see what you mean. And yeah. so perhaps at certain times mm. the best thing can be to actually speak mm. rather than always the refraining. Is that... I think that's a very, that's very true. It's time and place, isn't it? It's always time and place. So, yeah. if something uh, needs to be interrupted, as it were, yeah. something that's going down that you th you feel is very negative, if you can do it in a skillful way, you know, not from anger, mm. that's very good. You know, if you can just point out, look, uh, this is not you know not for your benefit, the person who's saying it, or the other pe or the person you're talking about's benefit. You know, if you can point it out in a good way. That, that's wonderful if you can do that. It's very hard to get ah. people to listen to you, actually. It's very, it happened to the Buddha. <laughs> they wouldn't listen to him. <laughs> so what to say of us. Yeah. So thank you. No, that's a very good point. Sometimes we have to speak. Uh, we, it's good to speak. And, uh, and we may be speaking about <laughs> difficult things. But when we are speaking about difficult things, to make sure that we have, you know, in our mind, well, if we have loving kindness, that would be fantastic. But, you know, sort of coming from a, a, a calm place or a calmer place, you know, and also not coming from a strong negativity, you know, and wanting to really tell them, <laughs> straighten them out, you know, which is anger, actually. So thank you for that. That's very good. There we are. And I think the couple from the internet. And is there any more? No, that's it. That's good, you know, because speech, you see, speech has also got incredible power too, you know, it's got an incredible power. That's what the, the word of the Buddha is about, <laughs> the power of the word. So here we are, oh, it's on the phone. And okay, so this one says, uh, for those who come from unsafe environments, unsafe. where anger served to protect us, how can we see that it only causes suffering in others or ourselves in most situations. Sorry, can you repeat that again, Street Youth? Uh, anger? For those who come from unsafe environments, unsafe environments, yeah. Where anger served to protect us, how can we come to see oh, that it only causes suffering in others or ourselves in most situations? Oh, all right, all right. So this is uh, anger in the sense of um, attack as a best defence. Yeah, no, that's right. 
wow, I would, <laughs> wow, to live in such an environment, you know, if that's the, your everyday environment, of course, I, I think that's difficult. I, I think, you know, in those cases, in that case, you know, each, each one of us has to ask, don't, don't we? If we live in a toxic environment, whether it be at work or even at home, um, or at uh, university, school, wherever it is, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do about the causes and conditions that are creating this toxic environment? Can I stay in that environment? That's what I say to this person. Do I want to stay in this environment? Do I have a choice to, to uh, leave this environment? And my, you know, I think in my own case, if I was in a toxic environment, I think I would try to leave it, actually, if I felt I couldn't make a positive impact on it. Why stay? Because the only, if you live in a toxic environment, eventually one becomes toxic oneself. <laughs> and, and what happens is we start to become more like the environment surrounding us. Uh, you know, we become more angry, more aggressive. And yes, it is a form of self-defense, but what we're doing also is reshaping the programming to make it even more aggressive, strong. Uh, and uh, this we have to see if is that for my benefit or not, you know. And, and in this case, it's a form of protection. So I would suggest to this person that they look at changing their environment if possible. You know, it's difficult in family situations. I know if they're abusive partners and so on. There's many. It's not very simple. Human beings are not simple. <laughs> it's not the last. I hope that was okay for the person. I know that may not be easy for you. I I, I hear where the question is coming from. But in the in essence, we have to uh, remove ourselves from toxic environments. I think if we can. It is. It is living in a suitable place is is conducive, is a highest blessing. The, the Buddha said, and it's very true. Because if we live in unsuitable places, it's very difficult to develop spiritually. We're just in the the battlefield. <laughs> We're living in a battlefield. That's not so pleasant, actually. Okay, next one. If we have a choice, we can. Yes. How does one handle a psychopath narcissist brother that <gasps> robbed them, robbed the entire family from most of their income? How can one child be the empath? How can one child be the empath? A M P T A H. Impact. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. That last one. Wow, that is really difficult. Yes, if someone is a sociopath, is it like? A psychopath, so sounds like a sociopath or a psych, psychopath. And these are, there are people who, uh, it's like somebody has no moral sense whatsoever, no sense of another person, where they're coming from. They cannot put themselves in that person's place. And so um, with, with such a person, I, if we're talking in terms of speech anyway, uh, I think I would keep the speech to the minimum. <laughs> To, uh, it's very difficult to deal with people like that, but um, certainly, you know, we have to look after where we're coming from, you know, uh, the uh, defilements that come up for us, and as much as possible, if you have to have interactions with them, um, to keep them as very, very uh, um, calm, coming from, from meta, from your side anyway, and... Uh, no, very, very difficult, actually. I think, you know, this is the area that, uh, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists actually focus on. But, you know, if you have never met somebody like this, I have actually met pe people like this. I've met once or twice. And it's really, it's a shock to you to, to meet people who have no human, they're not like human values at all. The human values are not there. It's really shocking. And how to uh, deal with these people. But of course, we've got to look after where we're coming from, uh, you know, in terms of our own mind. But in this case, too, talking about uh, also about wealth and, uh, you know, abuse of being, being stolen from, you know, being misappropriated, you'd probably say misappropriated, uh, things like this. So you have to use a lot of wisdom and not, and not uh, um, get, not let it um, turn your mind into a toxic state. That's not easy, actually. And in the end, for somebody like this, it, it's very hard to do it, but to have compassion, because you realize, you know, usually people who have these conditions have had a abusive childhood or they've had some uh, problems from the past, maybe even past lives, you know. I think I wouldn't put, I would, would think that could be the case. It's extraordinary to meet somebody like that. So you have my uh, sympathy. I, can, I, I think that's a terrible state to be in, actually, to have somebody like that. 
but to realize in the end, and this is one of the things that helps us with anger, is to realize each and every one of us has our own karma. We will receive the results of that too. The things we do say and think will have a result. And this uh, brother, or I think it was, he will have to have to experience the results of that one day, someday down the track. And it's not going to be pleasant if they do these really unwholesome things deliberately. So, and, you know, it's not revenge from our side, but it's just a realization. When we realize that, actually, it can make us feel compassion because you think, oh, wow, what's coming for them is really bad. You know, it's going to be extraordinarily bad. So, um, this is something good to reflect on. We each are the own, our, we are each the owners of our own karma, and we'll have a result. And same for your brother or whoever he was. Yeah, it will be the same for him too. One day we can overcome to a certain extent by trying to understand this guy and have compassion. You can overcome yes. to a certain extent. I think if you that's that's quite true because if you if you have an understanding that this person, you know, even though we have labels, you know, labels are not people, but they have they do point to some general characteristics. If we understand this person has this problem, they're completely immoral, amoral and uh, can do anything and say anything that most people can't <laughs> normally do and say, then that actually helps us. Understanding always helps us, actually, always helps us. So when we come across somebody like that and we don't realise they're like that, then that really causes a grief because we think we're, we're, we're um, uh, dealing with somebody who's got a full deck of cards, you say, but it's not the case. It's somebody who is very very badly damaged so we have to you know have to be very careful very careful so but that's right thank you very much for that dr jaya that uh, if we understand the situation always in buddhism wisdom is is the is one of the major things that can reduce our difficulties and lead to purifying the mind 